Hey everyone, welcome back to the 443 Security Simplified. I'm your host, Mark the Liberty, and joining me today is Corey Teleport Knockreiner. <laughs> <laughs> On today's episode, uh, we are coming to you both from the same room for the first time since the pandemic. Look, he's 3D. I never knew it happened. You're normally so flat. <laughs> this is, this is kind of cool. I can see his profile even. Man, we used to do all these in this little room, and now we're doing it out of various rooms across the country, but it's good to be back. Yeah, for sure. Um, on today's episode, we'll be covering some of the latest news, including research on more car hacking, this time involving mobile apps. Vroom, vroom. Uh, some research on more nation state sellings or spyware selling organizations to nation states. I don't know a sound effect for that. <laughs> Or just wah, wah, wah. There you go. And then yet another breach uh, affecting a very popular password manager. That might be the wah, wah, wah. That too, yeah. Uh, I guess on that, let's just go ahead and uh, teleport our way in. Oh, yeah, Yeah. teleport in. There There we we go. go. So let's start with the, uh, the first story this week. Uh, So security researcher Sam Curry published a Twitter thread about a week ago with their work alongside another researcher, actually a couple from, pausing here for a second, uh, researchers from Yugo Labs, which in my brain, I'm like, I know what that is. Put two two together. Yugo Labs? They're the uh, organization responsible for the Bored Ape Yacht Club NFTs and all that other stuff. God, no. (laughs) Anyways. That said, uh, these two particular individuals from there on their security engineering team, I remember from previous news posts, like they're actually talented at what they do despite the organization they work for. Um, I'm just happy that that uh, Justin Bieber gorilla that was like a couple million is now what, like 6K or something. Still, oops, 6K too much. <laughs> it for is. It'll be $64 crap. one day and then 64 cents one day later. Yeah. Anyways pivot back, Uh, they posted their research into identifying a vulnerability affecting all Hyundai Genesis models made after 2012, so the last 10 years. Uh, They could allow attackers to control the locks, the engine, the horn, the lights, basically anything that you could Everything the key fob is connected to, essentially, I assume, because you can start the engine nowadays with the key fob. So it sounds like it's a fob-related hack. Interestingly, uh, no. So they noted, like he posted in his first tweet, that the bulk of research around cars lately has been all the cool stuff with like breaking encryption and stuff around fobs and like replay attacks that we've seen over the past yeah. few months. But instead, they targeted the My Hyundai and My Genesis mobile apps for their oh, wow. research. So if you've got a, a Hyundai car, um, they've got a little app on your phone that you can log into your Hyundai account that uh, has you listed as the owner for your car's VIN. And through that, through the app, you can... It essentially just become the fob, though. You yes. don't carry it anymore, and your phone is what starts your car. In theory, yeah. Or if you <laughs> like are sitting inside and it's snowing out and you want to like open or make the car start running to warm up, that sort of thing. But I guess it must have some internet. I mean, the fob works wirelessly in a different way, I assume, yep. than the mobile app does. So, yeah, I assume it piggybacks through like the car's 4G or card. whatever connection to it. But uh, anyway, so they started out... Uh, they. Wanted to do like some analysis and figure out what potential vulnerabilities there were in it. Uh, they pulled up Burp Suite, really popular proxying tool for inspecting. Can we use it. Yep, web communications between an app and a server. Um, they broke it down to what the the typical request looks like when you go to unlock a door or start the car or whatever. So there's a post request that goes to a specific endpoint. So like unlock or start or lights on or whatever. Uh, inside that post request. There's a access token. Uh, so this is the authenticated JSON web token. JWT. Um, yep, good JWT, job defining it. A uh, really common method for logging in, receiving this JWT, and that acts as your session cookie effectively as you go across the site. Uh, JWTs typically contain some information that is then cryptographically signed by the web server. So they can decode it and say, oh, this is Mark. Here's his email. Here's his user ID. Here's when he logged in, all within this little cryptographically protected string of text that you can pass back and forth. A lot of website, web applications use JWT, well, yep. well-known technology. Um, outside that, though, there was also parameters in the post request, too. So in the post body, it would send the user's email again. So it's in the JSON web token, but they also sent it in the body of the post. 
and then the VIN number of the car. So some clear text stuff you could Correct. grab if you saw. So they they found pretty early on uh, that the the server validates those parameters and makes sure that the email address in the body matches the email address in the JSON web token. A uh, really common type of vulnerability in systems like this would be if I log in with my marketwatchguard.com account and then the body of the post sends some different email address and manipulate that account instead too. Luckily, in this situation, they were doing some validation to compare those emails were the same. Um, but you know, the, these researchers surmised that if they could find some way to trick it into validating those parameters as a victim's account, then in theory, they could submit requests to this, uh, this API and start controlling the car. Um, so they found, uh, just through some fuzzing, uh, that first off, by the um, way, I'm sure our listeners know, but fuzzing is just trying random junk in parameters to see what happens. And sometimes you can, you know, find things that crash things or things that respond in ways that are different. And that gives you hints to what you might do. Fuzzing is also taking a balloon and rubbing it against your Christmas sweater. Or your hair. Yep. Um, so they found through fuzzing it that the uh, first off, the web app for this doesn't require a user to validate their email address when they create an account. So like, you know, most sites or apps you sign up for, you create an account, and then before you can use edit at all, you have to click some link sent to the email. So that was one weakness. And they also found that the uh, regular expression, the regex that the site was using to validate the email address itself for accounts uh, was a bit weak or a bit loose, and that it allowed control characters in the email address field too. So you can probably assume where we're going here. They found that they could register a new account. So like, let's say they're tar targeting a victim, uh, mark at watchguard.com. They could register an account, mark at watchguard.com, with a carriage return line feed character tacked on the end. And another email goes right yep. after it. Lovely. Technically, a different email address uh, passes the regular expression validation. You don't even need to validate the email because remember that first weakness of not sending that link. Uh, and so then they could use this new account which the JSON web token would contain uh, mark at watchguard.com carriage return line feed. But in the body, they could just send mark at watchguard.com and the validation that the uh, the server was doing would say, yep, those Passes. are the same. Yeah. Um, so they then found an API endpoint where the only parameter in the body is just the email address and it returned the VIN number of all the cars registered to that account. So then they had both pieces of information and they could successfully carry out any of the actions that the app could do against these cars. So I thought this was cool because like, I'm pretty big personally into like finding web app vulnerabilities. That's one of my, to toot my own horn fortes. Um, and it's fun seeing a web app vulnerability affect a car to the point where you could steal the car effectively, yeah. start it. I, I don't know if you can drive it away without the key fob in there, but you can at least start it remotely, which is a bit of an issue. Good question. I don't know if I would trust 4G enough to not carry my key fob. So even if the phone could allow you to, hopefully people carry their key fob. There's been a couple of times where I've like hop in, hopped in my car, um, handed off the key to like someone else or like forgot the key with someone else and made it all the way home, realizing I no longer had the key in the car, which meant I could not stop it unless I never oh, no. wanted to start it again. <laughs> um, but so in this situation, they actually reported to Hyundai. They fixed it relatively quickly. And they published a big old Twitter thread going through all the details on it. Hopefully, was it the entertain? What did they have to firmware, I assume, for the car itself? It's the mobile app itself in this situation. Oh, so good. no so modifications to the, the car. car. That's good. Basically, all they had to do was just a add better, email validation, yeah, yeah. fix the reg regexes. Everything on back end, maybe in the mobile phone app. Yeah. I will say whenever I see things that have been around, like the, a lot of news says, this vulnerability has been around for 20 years. I'm like, so what? That doesn't mean people found it. But in cars, sometimes I do worry. It sounds like it wasn't the case here. But the problem with car vulnerabilities is they don't, depending on where the vulnerability is, it's harder to update <laughs> you know, the firmware of your car. Right. And I think even the vendors are take more time to do it just because it's your car, so they have to get the update perfect. Knock on Tesla all you want, but one good thing that they've done to the car over industry the is over-the-air updates, which Forced is nice. over there, yes. which, I mean, it could have some downsides too, but mostly from a security <laughs> perspective, it's a good thing to do. Yeah, like anything to be able to make it easier to update firmware on a 
multi really tens of thousands it. of dollars. I machine. mean, the, some of the old cars, you literally would have them to drive them in and either get some technician to plug into USB or OBD2. And that's just silly. No one's going to update their firmware if that's the case. So yeah. I definitely so, prefer Tesla. Luckily, this seemed to be relatively easy. Like just fix the web app and as long as it validates well, you don't need to patch a bunch of cars. Cars are still a target, man. Cars are still a and target. fancy new features are just adding a tax surface. I, for one, am looking forward to seeing the first hackers start to get past some of these subscription model things we're seeing for new cars. Like I saw Mercedes Ugh. with their newest cars. You have to pay like an $1,800 a month uh, subscription fee to accelerate faster. Well, I guess at least we won't have to hack to tune now. We'll just have to pay to tune. I mean, the old FBI videos of you wouldn't download a car are actually slowly starting to become true. Yeah, man. <laughs> It, Maybe may. I will download a car FBI now if these vendors lock everything out just to make more profit. We may have a future where you need Why to can't I use the car? hardware I own, vendor? I'm yes. sorry. I don't really like this new. I, so it's, yeah, it's tough. The one that really bugs me is like BMW. You have to pay a fee for heated seats on some of their new models. Put the technologies it's, there. It's like, it's, it's not like a there. margin. They're, they're losing margin on the heated seat for every car they sell, but yeah. or they're not losing. They're probably making money f- even despite the fact that the heater's there, it's just extra profit for yep. them to turn it on. This is a future I hope gets snuffed out real dang quick. Uh, otherwise, it won't. money uh, speaks. Correct. But we've watched knows? the gaming companies. Although there's some backlash, gaming companies are going backwards. So maybe the car companies will learn in the long maybe run. Maybe we'll start to see like game console hackers move over to cars and start jailbreaking already happened, cars. Right? And, Isn't yeah. that where GeoHots, who's now helping secure Twitter, went to? George right. Hots. Yep. He hacked the the PS3, I think, first. Jail broke it, but then he went into car hacking. And, and then now he's fixing Twitter's search. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, uh, moving on. So also last week, uh, the password management vendor LastPass announced they had suffered another data breach, uh, this time saying they detected unusual activity within a third-party cloud storage service that they share with their subsidiary or partner company go to uh, they said that there was uh, well there was limited details in the actual report they were pretty tight-lipped about it um, but they're I think only because of investigation if I, yep. I, I I might be going in defending unnecessarily mode but they do have a transparency blog where they release this and I yep. think it's because they're still investigating so while we want to know more because <laughs> you know they they shared that passwords are safe there's a lot of questions. Uh, I do think they're trying to be transparent. And we and all that know that like, at certain points of the investigation, there's things you may not be able to share either just for, you know, police authority investigation and also because you don't know yet you're investigating. Before we get into my opinions on this, which have changed since the last time we discussed a LastPass breach, uh, to LastPass's credit, like you just said, they are, in my opinion, one of the most transparent and open password managers there are. Like they've had multiple security incidents, most of them Seven pretty since small. Since 2011, but they are very good about quickly notifying their customers and the public when one of these incidents occurs, with as much details as they can provide. And they come back after the fact and tend to provide more details too once they've actually figured it out. And so, hopefully it works, but they take that same stance. I forget the marketing term they call it, but they don't know the keys to your kingdom, just like Apple. While all of your keychain and cloud data is in Apple's cloud, it's encrypted with a private key that only you have on your device's TPM. While there's no TPM involved, only we should have, there's blobs of our password data in LastPass's cloud, but it should all be encrypted with our private key. LastPass themselves can't even access it, let alone someone that might be able to steal the blob. So they call it their, what is it, zero knowledge architecture. And like at a high level, basically what it means is your LastPass account is your email address and your master password. That master password should be very strong yeah, yeah, but... because it is ultimately what encrypts your password bundle. So like you said, giant blob of every credential you store in there. Um, when it gets sent into LastPass's cloud to be able to go to all your other devices, locally within your browser or their app or whatever, you encrypt that bundle with your password and then send that encrypted bundle up to LastPass. So at this point, they technically have your passwords but they're secured with strong encryption with a password that you know. In order to get that bundle on another device, so let's say I move from my laptop to my phone, when I log in locally 
it hashes my password. I think they say 10,001 times using a pretty computationally wow. expensive hashing algorithm. So it takes a decent amount of time, difficult to brute force. Um, then using that password hash, you then authenticate to LastPass. So again, they only know your hash after 10,001 rounds of that said, 10,001, it takes, by computer standards, a long time, but it's probably milliseconds. So the one thing that you said that a listeners need to know, your freaking master password, like, I'm cool with using cloud password managers despite this exact scenario because of this zero trust architecture model. But I also have what I think is a 27 character password. If you have an eight character password or lower, even despite the extra hashing, you know, repeating they do, you know, it makes brute forcing possible. So good news is you probably haven't lost your your stuff unless you're using a really weak ass password for your master password. Don't do that. Yeah. So locally your client app browser, whatever, sends the hash, authenticates you, they go, yep, this is Mark, and they send down the encrypted password bundle to your local machine, your browser, app, whatever. And then locally, the app will use your master password to then decrypt that, and you have access to your whole vault. So at no point does LastPass know your master password because it's all handled locally, or do they have access to your unencrypted vault, which adds a lot of security. And it means that with previous breaches, like even if they get a hold of your vault, they would still have to crack your password in order to get into it. So like you said, if you've got a 27-character password, you are, in general, pretty safe until quantum computers become a thing and they're able to break AES-256 encryption like that. Yeah. Um, but so in their statement, they said, quote, our customers' passwords remain safely encrypted due to LastPass's zero-knowledge architecture. So this is actually something I wanted to highlight that kind of stuck out to me. So I'm a LastPass user. Uh, I've used it personally for a while. So like I've seen every single breach notification they've sent through. And they're typically like, when you're an organization, you've suffered a breach, you pick your words very carefully in these notifications. And typically they say, the previous ones, they go, pa the your password vault vaults were not been lost. Like the last one they had in August, they said it was limited to the development environment. They took some source code and technical information. Uh, but uh, our systems and designs and controls prevented the threat actor from accessing any customer data or encrypted password vaults. So they've always said something along the lines of your encrypted password vault was not accessed. This one, they say customer passwords remain safely encrypted, yeah. which you'll notice is very different from saying it they didn't get your vault. It suggests the vault may be gone. Yeah. I mean, clearly this, uh, they, they, by the way, this is the, the issue was in a third party cloud vendor that they used to store stuff. So this is probably some big file store for them. And by the way, also GoTo. Mm -hmm. I think they're the same company now as GoTo, Meeting, GoTo, whatever. Uh, and, and a lot of people use public cloud infrastructure like all of our listeners, AWS, Azure, Google, whoever. So clearly they seem to have gotten into a, a private production cloud storage, it seems like. We're, we're hypothesizing. hypothesizing based on what we know. We do know it involves a third-party cloud vendor for sure, though. So yeah, I, I, I'm, I do think the vaults have been, you know, at least some might be stolen for the exact reason you say. Which is, honestly, it's pretty big. So again, I, I don't is. like to... Uh, I'm not worried about it yet, though. Correct. Yes. Again, Unless I used a dumb password like 1234 as my master password. That would be my pretty dumb. Vault. I doubt that. I wonder if their app even lets you do that crap. God, I, I <laughs> never tried. That's a good thing. I'd like to try. Yeah. <laughs> It'd be fun. So, like, the good news is if you are a LastPass user and you've got a strong master password, you are almost certainly safe. Even if they've got your vault, like, they would still need your master password to get into it. Does leave you susceptible to say like social engineering to potentially give if, up that somewhere down the yeah, line? Yeah, that master password. If you get malware on your computer, it, I don't care how long it is, it can get leaked, but it, it takes more steps. So we have seen really long passwords show up in password data breaches before. So if you do reuse things like that, I, I would say we, we may not be there, but I changed my master password immediately, even though there's no evidence that. That's changed. I just changed my master password out of habit. Yep, that would be a smart action. I think it doesn't unfortunately solve the the issue of the vault with the old password is 
potentially, potentially out still there out there. Yeah, it's which, not getting the update. Like, at what point do you pull the trigger and use some of their automated tools to go to just change all of change them. all your passwords? It like, does at least make it easy to mm-hmm. do that. Them um, and other password manager vendors, one of the great things they do is they do make it really easy first to notify you when like one of your accounts has a credential that was found in some other breach. And then just through a couple button presses, they can even do all of the requests to the various apps they support to yeah. go and change your password. So if you're a LastPass customer, I'd say keep an eye on their blog. You probably got the email from them already. We'll see what additional details come out. I'm and sure it, they will release an update at some point. And it's, you know, it's December now. So maybe it's that time for the annual password rotation or something. For sure. It's actually not that hard to do. Uh, so consider it. I would say, by the way, this random advice, WatchGuard has not released it yet, but uh, we might have a password manager soon as part of our auth point, uh, which we have already, of course, started using internally. So because of that, I also exported, uh, you know, you can tell me and Mark if you use LastPass for various purposes in the past, but I tried to export all of my passwords to just get the prepared to move if I ever need to. Do know that it's a great feature, but it's just this raw clear text CSV file. So if you do export your password, either encrypt or get rid of that file really freaking quickly. It was It's just scary to, to, like to my export. Got yours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hope not, because it's, it's just seeing that big list. Yeah. Although it also makes me happy because all of the passwords are like these up to 32 character random crap. I'm, I would never know how to log on to any of my sites without that manager. I, yeah, I don't know the overwhelming majority of the passwords for the accounts I use on a daily basis. So I'd be kind of screwed if I ever permanently lost access to At least to that. you'd still have our email address so we could, it would just be a whole heck of a lot of resetting. Yep. So one, before we pivot off, one last kind of final blemish, I guess, that stood out to me was they noted that uh, they were able to get in using uh, information from the August 2022 incident that LastPass had. So back in August when they got on the that developer That didn't involve vaults, but that did have some credentials that were leaked. So it sounds like they didn't rotate their own credentials after that incident, which if you are as an organization, if you suffer a data breach and you think that there, like any user account involved with that breach, anything they potentially had access to, rotated. rotate the credentials. Not, not just like usernames and password or passwords for usernames, but like any other authentication material you use, like keys or certificates, whatever. You may even argue that better segmentation and less reuse too, because one was a development environment, one is a production environment. Should there be shared keys between those at all, you know, or, or should you have different <laughs> credentials for different environments? As was, either way, rotate them. Yep. But yeah, there's a Reddit thread where they're discussing, like, I don't think this is a reason to drop LastPass if you use them or like them. I actually, you know, it, it sucks to see seven breaches since 2001, although that is 11 years. But I think if you look at all the other password uh, vendors, they've had vulnerabilities and breaches too. I just think LastPass is a big target. Uh, but they people are definitely discussing whether this is one too many or not. Yeah. And still, you know, at the end of the day, props to them for the awkward and unfortunate position of having of being so transparent. Like it's it's good seeing a company come out there, even when they're still investigating, but still letting their customers know so they have a chance to act on it potentially. So no one, if you're them. in security, you don't want your security breached. But if you care about your customers and you care about security, you realize you need to tell people something so that they can protect themselves. And so far, so good for LastPass. Yeah. And if you're not in security, you don't care about your security at all, as I think we are going with that too, right? I, I wish I wasn't, <laughs> but sometimes it seems that way. Yeah. Let's look at every non-security IoT device. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, 100%. Uh, so moving on to the last uh, story, though. Last week, Google's Threat Analysis Group, or TAG, uh, published their findings on an exploitation framework called Heliconia, Helisonia. It's from I would have gone Conia, but so maybe with the area you could funky. be right. But yeah. Heliconia is how a, this yeah. stupid American would pronounce it. Correct. Uh, exploit kit likely developed by a company called Veristin IT out of Barcelona, Spain, that claims to be a quote provider of custom security solutions. Basically, the Spanish equivalent of NSO Group. That's exactly what I was going to say. Another legitimate we make malware company yeah uh so this analysis from google they 
the forward to it is basically saying they are constantly trying to combat these spyware as a service companies that like NSO group that are uh, selling exploit code and malware to nation states and like other unscrupulous organizations. Uh, and then hopefully not. They all claim, oh, it's just the nation states. And by the way, it's just the good guy nation states. But we've all found that that's not the case, that yeah, adversarial that. ones have gotten their hands on them too. Uh, so they noted that – so the framework was built to exploit what they call end-day vulnerabilities, so mix of zero-day and recently patched issues in Chrome, Firefox, and Microsoft Defender and used to deploy payloads onto targeted devices. Um, they said that while they don't have any evidence of these tools as they were used in the wild, um, we'll get into how they got a hold of them in a second. Uh, they do believe, based off the vulnerabilities and other data, uh, that they were likely utilized as zero days in the wild. So sometime years ago, before these issues were patched, they were already being used by this toolkit developed by this wow. Spanish company. Um, so they actually they identified the framework and all these files uh, when they received a anonymous submission to their Chrome bug reporting program, uh, each containing instructions and source code. And they had some unique names in the bug reports. So there was Heliconia Noise, Heliconia Soft, and files. And so they analyzed these submissions and found they had these frameworks for deploying exploits and uh, a script within the source code that had clues pointing back to that Veriston IT Spanish company. Um, so in their blog post they just put out, they go through the details of each of these three reports they got. Basically, it was someone, maybe a disgruntled old employee or someone that found it through analysis of maybe one of the victims, opened up bugs in Google Chrome gave them the source code of these applications themselves, and then left. So the first one, pretty interesting, uh, Heliconia Noise. It's a web framework developed for a Chrome renderer exploit, followed by a sandbox escape and agent, agent installation. So your web browser, it runs in a sandbox. Generally, what's supposed to happen is if you're able to exploit the browser, you can't escape that sandbox and perform actions on the machine itself. Unfortunately, because... Everyone in the world uses web browsers. They're a really popular target both for finding these code execution issues uh, and for finding sandbox escape issues that you get out of the browser and start acting on the machine itself. Um, so within the, uh, the exploit kit source code, there's a manifest file in each of these with a pretty uh, accurate description of what each of them do. So this is from the developers themselves. Uh, this first one was uh, called a, quote, one-click full chain for Google Chrome without persistence reaching medium integrity. Basically saying the user has to interact, but just one click is enough to do it. You're able to gain full code execution on the machine, no persistence, and you're not going to get system level. You'll get whatever the user's level is or something equivalent to that. Still, at least these jerks are good at documenting their code. <laughs> Honestly, I, that's, when I saw that and you see the others, it's like, yeah, man, they're good documentation. Thanks. Good on them. <laughs> <laughs> so this one, it targets a, a vulnerability in V8, which is Chromium's uh, JavaScript engine. Um, it was, to get technical, a de-optimizer bug that they had originally fixed in August 2021. But they actually didn't assign a CVE to this one huh. uh, because they noted that Internally found issues, which this one was, they don't typically provide a CVE for. This is Google, right? This is Google themselves. Hmm. So, so journalists and jerks out there that get mad at vendors for not providing CVEs for internally discovered vulnerabilities should be attacking Google too. Huh. <laughs> hmm. Corey, you want to tell me what you're hurt about? No, no, I'm <laughs> just uh, I, I'm I'm irritated by journalists who don't know security. Yeah, 100%. Uh, so moving on, uh, the source code itself included a pre-commit cleaning script. So basically, let's say you're using VS Code or some other uh, development environment. Before you commit code to your source code repository, like GitHub or whatever, you generally want to run it through some script to like clean up crap. Usually it's like good code uh, formatting practices, like grammar, spelling, whatever. In this case, they actually had a script in there designed to look for sensitive strings like Veriston and actual developer names uh, and server names. And if they found those in like any of the binaries that were included or the files, it would strip them out. Theoretically, so like they didn't expect other people to have access to the full-on source code in the script. 
but they would have access to the compiled files that come out of it. And you want to make sure there's no indicators yeah, of who you are. Yeah, this is the first thing malware analysts do is run a scripts to see any human readable language that might, and, and sometimes TTPs, yep. tools, tactic, you know, stuff that might identify you is accidentally left there. But so in this situation where they smart. have the source code, like it's just it a big old things. spotlight on exactly yeah, who yeah. likely developed this. Um, the exploit uses a Flask web server. So Flask is a pretty popular framework that uses Python uh, as a web server, similar to like Nginx or Apache would be as a binary versus Python. Um, and it had six different endpoints as part of the exploit chain. Things like serving up the remote code execution vulnerability in iframe, serving up the sandbox escape shell code, serving up the agent, so the actual malware you're trying to run, uh, and then the agent itself, along with a few others like the, the landing page that they end up on. Um, some interesting tidbits about the, the exploit toolkit. Uh, so you can configure target validation on it too. So basically, if you want to specifically go after people in, let's say, the Ukraine, not that any nation state would be going after individuals Why in would the that country happen? Ukraine. Or Russia. Never would happen. You could limit it to specific browser user agents. So maybe everyone there uses like Opera. Uh, you could limit it to that. Limit it to country IP addresses. Uh, limit it to a specific client ID. So across this framework, you can track individuals that repeatedly come back and limit it to just those. And for anyone else, just redirect them to some other website. So that By the they... way, very common in even criminal web exploit frameworks out there that are sold on the underground. It's a, to some extent a security vendor nightmare because one of the first things they blacklist is is security. You know, they if you're these IPs, we're, we're, we are going to send you to the safe looking website that doesn't do anything. Makes it difficult to analyze yeah, it yeah. after the fact. Yeah, the, of course, vendors are smart enough to know to start to, we have burp suite, we can pretend to be something else. But, you know, if, if you don't know what they're looking for, it does take work and guessing to, to get the right parameter or get the right set of things so that it actually responds in the malicious way. And with that client ID, like it doesn't even necessarily mean like targeting this journalist. You can typically configure these things in a way where like, let's say I stumble upon the site as a victim. It attempts to attack me registers like the fingerprint in my browser with the client ID. But if I ever come back, yeah. it'll redirect me so that if I'm an analyst, first it's time I see it, It's also tied to work. spamming solutions. If you've ever noticed the the URLs they send you that are taking you to a web exploit kit, they tend to have a parameter that's unique to you. So sometimes they, if you go to that site without a parameter that they know they've emailed to, they're not going to respond. So I assume it's a similar type of ID like that, that they can keep track of. And if if you have never registered with their system or been spammed or been targeted to them, you won't have the right ID to. Yep. Uh, so the second uh, piece of software in this framework was called Heliconia Soft. This one was a web framework that deploys a PDF containing a Windows Defender exploit. Uh, it's specifically a bug in the JavaScript engine that runs in Windows Defender uh, that was originally fixed back in November 2021. Uh, so the manifest description for this one was Windows Chrome and Chromium Edge, one-click chain without persistence reaching system integrity. That's a little more than the web user. It is. So basically, it only requires the victim to download a PDF, which triggers Windows Defender to scan it, which the malicious content in the PDF then triggers, compromises the Defender process, which understandably runs with system permissions, and lets them deploy malware on the system then. And as everyone that's a Windows administrator, all, all cap system is the local administrator. Yep. Essentially, it's, it's the main system account really, but it's same privileges for so local one's admin. A bit more serious, but again, this one still requires like a click. You have to trick the victim. Although this is a, it. In, interesting, like a, there's different levels of user interaction, mm -hmm. you know, downloading not necessarily as dangerous as opening. <laughs> right. It, like um, even a malware researcher might knowingly download a PDF they suspect is malicious, not because they want to open it in Adobe thinking that might trigger an exploit, but because they want to research it. The fact that this triggers only on downloading and not on opening, still technically user interaction, but I would say for document-based user interaction, it's one step easier than, than average. And one click is still a pretty dang low barrier for entry to exploiting someone. It's like, as opposed to when you hear zero click, that's typically like, you it don't just have to happens. do anything. Yeah, like yeah, they yeah, send you bad. a text message and it exploits the 
the mes- messaging app. Or you in have your phone. a port open, and someone can just take over your yeah. computer because you have that port open. So this one, you do still have to convince them to somehow land up on the page. So like a phishing link, or a redirect, or a malicious advertisement, or something like that. Um, but still, system level on this one, pretty bad. The final one was called Helico- or just files, but still related to these. Um, and it was a fully documented Firefox exploit chain for both Windows and Linux. So the exploit was actually patched back in March of 2022 in Firefox. Um, but within this documentation uh, that was submitted ultimately to Google, uh, you can see actually which versions of Firefox it was designed to explicitly target. So it was designed for Firefox 64 through 68, uh, 68 being the one right before it was patched. 64 actually being from December 2018. So you could infer here that this particular exploit may have been used as early as like 2018 and 2019, not patched until 2022, which is kind of nuts. Um, This one didn't have any like other exploit code. It was mostly just here's how it works. Uh, But still another very powerful tool, especially considering like I'm willing to bet there's a sizable portion of our population out there that does not keep their browser updated despite Google and Firefox making it very easy and very annoying letting you know when you haven't updated to the latest fix. So all of these were allegedly uh, developed by this Spanish organization that creates spyware and sells it to companies. Um, I'd be curious to see now that some of the details are out who was potentially using these and like who they were going after. Because as we saw with NSO group, they were used by, yes, maybe nation state law enforcement within a country, but they were pretty loose on who they were targeting in terms of criminals or a journalist or something like that. Yeah. I don't know. I, I, to me, the web exploit kit framework is is not unusual. We've seen these on the criminal underground for a long time. Even some of the sophistication is big. I will say a lot of web exploit framework kits have libraries of hundreds of web vulnerabilities. Although you know they're they're made to be servers. Oops, sorry, I didn't mute. They're they're meant to be servers that will pay attention to the client coming and might serve up one of a hundred different vulnerabilities depending on what it finds. Uh, but I guess the difference here is. So the sophistication, even the checking on client IT, and I, and I, I don't think is overly different than criminal malware, except for if some of it had zero day. Most of the web exploit framework kits that we see on the underground are mostly old vulnerabilities. Some may be a few months old, but patched. You, you can buy services that will continue to update exploits for these frameworks, but it's having the complex zero day which is getting harder nowadays because of like the sandbox. Having a sandbox bypass flaw for a browser like Chrome is big money now. Oh, it's got to be worth like millions. Yeah, at that we, point. we we see Pwn to Own, where they specifically doing a full remote code execution on Chrome gets you, I think it's a million bucks. So the, these aren't the zero day version. You know, none of them are zero day now, but. They might have been. That's probably why they sell the nation state. But all the exploit framework kit, it seems like a clean, good kit, but it's not much different than we see before. I'm just irritated that this is now considered a legitimate by eyes business, that a company called Very Bad, Verus, whatever the heck they're, the V. <laughs> I, I, I don't even want to say their good. name because why? why is this a business model? Now, as I say that, on the flip side, we use medicine. I mean, there's web exploit kits that security researchers use, but those are out in the open, well signatured, not hidden from the security community, not requiring Google to luckily get an anonymous submission to find this mysterious kit that no one knew about. Uh, I, I just don't like this business model personally. It does feel very gross and very easy to abuse. And as we've seen with the whole Pegasus malware, very heavily abused in some cases too. But I, I, I hate to say it if we, uh, you know, while I don't like the businesses that do it, uh, and I'm curious, we need to know who they're selling to. But we do know governments, even governments we consider good are willing to pay a million dollars for zero day now. So to some extent, I guess you got to blame the government too. They do, it seems like red teams in all governments, whether they're your government or some other government that your government is, thinks is adversarial, 
they are trying to find, I, I mean, really, it comes down to everyone knows how to do computer attacks, but you need that zero day to really have some sort of adversarial advantage against somebody else, whether you're the good guy or the bad guy. So at the end of the day, it might actually be our government strategy that's driving businesses to do this kind of gray area stuff. There is stuff. one glimmer of hope, though. It feels like the, the whole Pegasus and NSO group thing really shined a giant spotlight on this whole industry, as we'll call yeah. it. And at least within like Israel, they took some actions with that specific company. And it feels like in the wider range, especially the European Union, which Spain is a member state of, there seems to be an appetite for cracking down or at least like heavily restricting and licensing requirements for exporting some of these tools, just like you would for like exporting a gun or a bomb to some other country. And speaking to the U.S. government, I think in past podcasts, you know, we have relationships with some of the U.S. government uh, from our experiences and from the FBI uh, CISO Academy. It does sound like like they're, uh, I, I, we, we should be clear, the NSA and others are always looking for, for an advantage and they want to be strong in cyber, but they are focusing more on defense. And I think they've said it. And I think we have something called the Vulnerabilities Equity Program that the Obama administration put in place, which at least questions, you know, it, it's, hey, if the government finds a zero day and we want to not tell the vendor, can we do that? And it kind of discusses the risks of defense not. And while it is all behind the scenes, I don't think the public gets to see the process. They're at least talking about, you know, when can we hold on to something in case we need to use it to protect our country versus, you know, is it better to get vendors to fix things to protect our citizens. So, you know, I, I do think governments are trying to figure out a balance there too. And it seems like our government is starting to realize that when it's popular programs like Chrome and Firefox, I personally believe every citizen in the world uses these products, you know, one of those two. Oh, Chrome. I think I'm the only person in the world that uses I, I Firefox. I still have Firefox probably because of Tor browser more than anything else. Mm -hmm. But I, my default is certainly Chrome. But either way, it's, it's different than like a zero day in a, a, a PLC logic controller for a uranium <laughs> enrichment centrifuge. Right. It's something that Yes, I mean, the benefit is you could attack everyone in Russia with it if you wanted to, but if it's ever found out, every one of your own citizens is vulnerable. So I, I you know, it's, I, I do think having them in these really popular programs that everyone uses, are that's when the government should fix them instead of try to buy and hold on to them. You know, we used to, I guess we still technically do, but we used to have, you know, export grade encryption where we would limit what types of yeah. encryption algorithms we There's still countries we, do. we can't sell to because of that. So I wonder if we're going to end up in a spot where we've got United States versions of popular applications and operating systems and global versions. And if you were to happen to diff them and look at the code, you would see some have patched vulnerabilities and some, some don't. don't. That'd be interesting. Maybe that's a, a maybe we're already there. Has anyone <laughs> ever knows. downloaded I don't know. Microsoft Office from uh, <laughs> the US and or Ukraine? There's certainly been cases where even our own government has even gotten equipment being shipped outside the company by a vendor, captured yeah. the shipment, put in a different version of Trojan firmware and repackaged it with I'm the sealant tape. I'm willing to bet tape. that happens quite a bit, actually. <laughs> so interesting stuff. And crazy, crazy future. Uh, but at least in this particular situation, if you keep your browsers up to date with the latest security patches, like Firefox and Google do a really good job of it now. You get that exceedingly oh, more it annoying turns little orange, yeah, red, yeah. yellow. Just, yeah, yeah. I, all I you like do it. is hit the button and you come back Bam. and you're good to go. They'll even save your tab history so you don't yeah. even have to do it, 5,000 open tabs that are draining my battery currently. I, I got one tab thinking it would help because I can close them all up. Instead, if I go to one tab, now I have this <laughs> freaking yes. thousands. That is how it goes. At least I hide them, though. <laughs> but yeah, in this situation, though, keep your browsers up to date. Uh, Google does a decent job, too, with their, what is it, like safe site thing where outside of browser updates, they can still dynamically block malicious websites as they find them. But if you just get rid of that low-hanging fruit, you'll keep yourself safe from a lot of these styles of attacks, too. This and other exploit kits. For sure. Man, exciting times. Job security. I guess so. Hey, everyone. Thanks again for listening. As always, if you enjoyed today's episode, don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. Mash that subscribe button. If you have any questions on today's topics or suggestions for future episode topics, you can reach out to us on Twitter 
as long as it still exists, which it currently does. It's moved to Mastodon or yeah. something. Uh, it's got its own problems too. Now, uh, I'm at XORRO underscore. Corey is at SecAdept. And the both of us are at hashtag the 443 podcast. Thanks again for listening, and you will hear from us next week. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>